Welcome to the last day of our Quantum Interaction Conference. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Professor Louis Nairns from uh, UC Irvine and in the uh, list of very distinguished uh, keynote speakers. So, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, I should warn you, I'm a cognitive scientist. I, I'm not a uh, physicist. And I don't know that much about physics. I do have high school physics. I got a C in the course. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't add very well. I got all the problems right. But, uh, but um, I've been involved with uh, various sorts of uh, mathematical applications and decision theory uh, and other areas and saw some potential for looking at non-Boolean algebras and, uh, and quantum-like algebras. And I started to read about quantum-like algebras maybe a year and a half, two years ago. So I'm relatively uh, new to the area. And uh, so I'll talk about uh, rationality uh, and its relationship to quantum-like algebras and, uh, and other ones. And rationality, I mean, sort of the way that economists use the word rational and the way that um, some philosophers, or probably most philosophers, use it. And they base rationality on various kinds of arguments. There's a few. I'll just talk about one, which is the Dutch book argument for rationality for finite additive probability theory. It's used as a justification for Kolmogorov probability theory, which is sigma additive. To get sigma additivity, you just wave their hands and add a bunch of words. Not too much there. But we start off with a Boolean, it assumes a Boolean underlying Boolean algebra of events. And this is one formulation of it. A bookie makes events, uh, make bets on events in the Boolean algebra. These bets are in the form of tickets. For each event A in the algebra, there's a ticket, boldface A, that will pay $1 if A occurs and $0 if A does not occur. Or if the complement of A occurs. In the near future, it will be known for each event A, whether A or its complement occurs. This is the usual thing in gambling that all these events occur. There's, of course, situations where some may be not occurring any time in the future. You don't always know what happens in the future. And a different logic is used for that. And the bookie sets prices. For each one, it sets a price between zero and one dollars for each ticket. And the prices, uh, and for each non-empty, each ticket describing a non-empty set. Then you have another participant, uh, an arbitrager, and he is said to be able to make a Dutch book against the bookie if only if he buys and sells tickets to the bookie at the bookie's price in a manner such that the arbitrager is guaranteed a profit no matter which state X is in. Well, from economic point of view, if you're the bookie, you're irrational. You set your bets irrationally. There's a theorem. Uh, it's called the Dutch Book Theorem. And uh, it says, set the probability of A being the price that is paid for the tickets in A. It's between zero and one, so it's a price. Then the Dutch book theorem states that the probability function P is a finite additive probability function on the Boolean algebra of events if and only if no Dutch book can be made against the bookie. That means these prices are coherent in some way and it gives rise to uh, uh, the finite. Edit. That's the theorem, not just mathematics. The philosophical part comes in the Dutch book argument. It says all rational probability functions on the Boolean algebra are finitely additive because of the Dutch book theorem. So it's an argument for additivity. There's a gap between the theorem and the additivity. In that gap is where philosophers try to make money. They argue one side of the other. And they argue about the gap. And you know, with this acceptance as sort of a nice condition to have. Leave out. <laughs> well, I'll use it. <coughs> so I, I generalized the Dutch book argument in, uh, in, in a book I recently uh, wrote. 
And I prevent, present a number of forms of fuller Dutch book argument, in turn, and also qualitative forms of the Dutch book argument that doesn't depend upon numbers. But I won't go into that. The basic idea of, for this talk, the type of generalization I want is, the Dutch book argument should apply not just to the Boolean algebra, but to the power set as well. Because after all, if you can't extend the prices somehow to the power set, then there's something wrong. Once again, I, so I, so you need a theorem to say, well, you know, it's just that maybe it's the case for the few events in a small Boolean algebra, you can do it, but you assign probabilities in such a way that if I give you a bigger Boolean algebra, you couldn't assign them there and there's going to be something wrong. So um, uh, you need to have a theorem. And uh, uh, the theorem is that you can always extend a finite additive probability function on the Boolean algebra to the complete algebra. And uh, uh, there's theorems in analysis where they do it using and look at and Bonnock theorem for uh, measurable uh, sets and other ones. This is very general and does it. And Tarski actually did something like this. Okay. <coughs> And the argument here is, uh, if, you, if the extension is rational, if by the Dutch book argument of theorem, the extension is going to be rational because it's finally additive, that means that the thing that you started with had to be rational. And this really, if you really think about it, this is really the theorem you want to, to have. But it also has the possibility now, I don't need to use a Boolean algebra. You just have a bunch of prices, and I say, well, they're rational. What do I mean by rational? You can extend it to the power set and get a finitely additive Boolean algebra. So this applies to any sort of algebra because it's only formulated in that way in terms of the prices, not in terms of any underlying algebra. And we'll use that. I'll use that as a criterion. I'm not going to argue that it's really rational in some deep sense that I leave the philosophers and the Dutch book argument or other ways that are sort of, all of them are sort of equivalent to three or four arguments for rationality. They all are really about the same. <coughs> and so we'll apply it to the first case. The first case is to uh, not start with the Boolean algebra, but to start with the distributive algebra. And that just means it, it's not complicated. And, uh, and then we want to put a probability function on it. The problem is, for the reason why finite additivity works in Boolean algebras, is that Boolean algebras are guaranteed to have a large number of disjoint events. If you don't have a large number of disjoint events, say you have only disjoint with the empty set, then every function <laughs> is finitely additive, right? Because you can't find disjoint events to try and refute it. So a Boolean algebra gives you a rich structure of disjoint events, but there's other algebras that don't. And if you have a, um, a, a distributive algebra where you just have union and intersection, uh, you, don't, you might have very few disjoint events. So you have to reformulate what probability is. And what you do is you reformulate in a way so it's equivalent to the usual definition of Boolean algebras. And this is called a generalized probability function. It's basically a counting function. And you just subtract off the intersection, which are Boolean algebras, the probability intersection is zero, so it doesn't matter. And so what I show is, well, if you have a distributive algebra of events, that you can always, and it satisfies uh, uh, the Dutch book argument, or it has a generalized problem, it has a generalized probability generalized finite additive probability on it. It could be extended to the whole Boolean algebra with a regular probability on it. And therefore, because by the Dutch book theorem, therefore it's rational. And there are various cases of such structures. Uh, one structure is where uh, the original algebra is a topology, because the topology is close in the union. Topologies are a bit stronger case than something that's used in philosophy and in computer science and several places called intuitionistic logic. So 
So this extends the Dutch book argument to intuitionistic logic. And, uh, uh, and we have topological algebras and so forth. OK, so that takes care of that part. Now we go into more quantum-like algebras. And I said I'm not a physicist, so I'm not really going to uh, talk in any depth about uh, uh, the use of quantum logics and quantum probability theory and, and physics. But I'll use something about their formal properties. And what my main objective is, is to talk about its use in psychology. And from this conference, it really reminded me particularly about its possible use in linguistics, where I think when it really wants different algebras than quantum algebras to capture what's going on. And yet they will have lots of the formal properties of quantum algebras, but they will be different. The difference is they'll be rational. Okay. And so I have to establish that the quantum one is not rational. So we'll start with uh, von Neumann. Uh, he, uh, he gave a foundation uh, for what was then a new field of quantum mechanics in his 1932 uh, book. Uh, and he used in his foundation a new form of probability theory based on events that were closed subsets <coughs> of the Hilbert space. These, as someone mentioned, correspond exactly to the projections in a one-to-one -one manner. Subsequent to the publication of this book, von Neumann was unhappy uh, with uh, the Hilbert space approach and searched for other alternatives. And now I'm going to go into a slightly different version of the last talk we heard yesterday. I'll talk a little bit about what his discomfort was in some detail. Uh, he formulated it in a uh, paper with a very famous paper with Birkhoff and von Neumann called The Logic of Quantum Mechanics. And he formulated the uh, event space for quantum mechanics in terms of an abstract algebra. And the abstract algebra formulation was something called an orthocomplemented modular lattice. And it's very much like a Boolean algebra of events. And but it's different in a key respect. And uh, I'll go into what that is. So this is what it, it consists of. It consists of a non-empty set, like in the Boolean algebra, and a set of subsets of that non-empty set that, that includes the sure event and the null event. And it has these uh, funny operations on it. I can get this to work. Maybe I have something. Can I turn this on somehow? Yes. Oh, there we go. It has uh, these funny operations. Generalized union, generalized intersection, generalized complementation, let's call it. And it's said to be an orthocomplement modular lattice if it's closed under these operations. And this operation is the least upper bound on two events in X in terms of the subset relation. And this is the greatest uh, lower bound of, of two events. And then if that happens, this is called a lattice algebra. And it's called an ortho lattice if it has a complementation operation. That's what these two equations say. And satisfies the Morgan's law. So it looks very much like a, uh, uh, a Boolean algebra in those sorts of things. The difference is it's modular. It satisfies, instead of a distributive law where or distributed where over and, uh, it, it has a restricted form of a distributive law, and that makes it modular. Complemented, orthocomplemented modular lattices basically gives you projective geometries or something very close to it. And, um, uh, and projective geometries have subspaces. Those subspaces really are just like the subspaces you have in the Hilbert space or the Euclidean geometry, except it has points at infinity, lines at infinity, planes at infinity. Throw all those infinities out and 
this is basically the same thing. Can I just check? Yeah. Um, the, so the difference between, um, yeah, just the, is it the if A contained in yes, the, the that's difference. the difference yeah, between, the difference. right, and if that condition wasn't there, it would just be the regular distributed law. That's is right. that right? Got it. Thank you. So it's a generalization. Okay. So uh, here's two examples of Boolean algebra, and the other example is the one you know, finite uh, subspaces of a finite dimensional in the product space, or more generally, the closed subsets of the Hilbert space. Um, it, it's orthomodular, but it's not modular. But, uh, it's a finite dimensional. If, 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 it's, if, it's, if it's finite dimensional, it's modular. If it's infinite dimensional, it's orthomodular. But Neumann became disenchanted with Hilbert space uh, probabilistic formulation for quantum mechanics after publication of the 1932 book and looked for other formulations. And he really thought he was on the wrong path. In about 1935 or 36, he wrote in a letter. He was going to give up that whole type of approach and try something new. And he ended up not trying something new. As mentioned last time, he went to von Neumann algebras. This is trying something a little bit more general than something new, and we'll talk about what was the fundamental problem we had. Kusami showed that the lattice of closed subspaces of an infinite dimensional Hilbert space was not modular. He suggested replacing the modular law and Birkhoff's and the von Neumann's quantum logic with a more general condition uh, for all closed subspaces of a Hilbert space called the orthomodular law. And the orthomodular law is a uh, special case of the modular law. It's where you uh, uh, substitute for A. Uh, for, it's just a special case. It's very easy to show. And he called the result an orthomodular lattice. You've got to be careful because the concept of orthocomplemented modular lattice and orthomodular lattices are different. Orthocomplemented modular lattices are orthomodular lattices, but not vice versa. And in uh, modern times, that means 1950 and beyond, um, orthomodular lattices are called quantum logics and philosophy and, and lattice theory. Um, they're actually much more general than quantum logics, and we'll talk about that. It's not clear that von Neumann knew about orthomodular lattices in this period from uh, 32 to 36, although Birkhoff said he did, but and none of his letters are unpublished works or published works, it gets mentioned. Here's von Neumann's last words on quantum probability. And it's my first words for what I will be doing. <laughs> OK. He says, I think it's quite important and will probably shade a great deal on, of new light on logics and probability after the whole formal structure of and, and yeah, and altered, I guess, the whole formal structure of logics considerably if one succeeds in deriving this system from first principles, in other words, from a pseudo set of axioms. Okay, sort of like Euclidean geometry or maybe Kolmogorov probability theory or something. <laughs> but the axioms should be basic and really each one tell you something about the subject matter and add up to what you want to capture. All existing axiomatizations of this system are unsatisfactory in the sense that they bring about quite arbitrary algebraic laws which are not clearly related to anything one believes to be true or that one has observed in quantum theory to be true. He basically going to say that so while one has very sophisticated formalistic foundations of projective geometry and some infinite generalizations of them, this is what von Neumann algebras that he mentioned, including orthogonality, including angles, none of them are derived from intuitively plausible first principles in the matter which axiomatizations in other areas are. Okay. And, uh, so what I'm going to do is, and Fahmein has more to say about this, and I'll bring it up a little bit later. So I'm going to develop a behavioral quantum logic. 
that is based upon principles. It's based upon exactly how experiments are run, and I claim how experimentalists really must think about their experiments, although they'll never say they do it this way. <laughs> because they don't talk about how they think about the experiments. And then, an example, we'll have two experiments, <coughs> experiment one, experiment two, a large Number of subjects are randomly distributed across half and one and half and two. Well, this is something that's very different in behavioral science than what you're doing in quantum science. Where does randomness come in? You have probability theory, you need randomness. This is where it comes in. The experimenter creates the randomness. And this is why you get able to use statistics. It's been half in one experiment, randomly half in the other experiment. That's where randomness come in. And for everything else, I can get by with having the subjects be deterministic. If I look at a single subject, then we have to bring randomness in in a different way, and we get things more like what Tenenbaum is doing. But I'm modeling a group of subjects making a decision, and not an individual subject making multiple decisions. And so I'm able to get by. Behavioral quantum logic occurs naturally in, in between subject experiments. So each subject in experiment one will make one choice, and each subject in experiment two will make one choice. These experiments are different, and what does the experimenter has to do? He has to somehow combine them by his thinking, his reasoning, because there's nothing in the world that's <laughs> combining the two experiments. They are combined theoretically. That's the only way you can do it. The participants are different. The choices they're making are different. You have to somehow identify choices and maybe identify participants. Each experiment can be viewed as a context. That's where this word of contextuality comes in. Of course, in Formal semantics, these would be different meanings you would assign to things, or disambiguations and things like that. A um, uh, large number of subjects are, are distributed, half across one, half across the other. Each subject makes a single choice among, in this, this case, three outcomes, A, B, and C, and one, D, E, F, and two. Outcomes across one and two are distinct, because as at a bar and other people do it, we index them. Once you're in a different experiment, you're given different instructions, the meaning of the choice is different to the subject, so we treat it differently. Later, the experimenter will want to say it's really the same, but that's part of the theory. That's not part of the evidence, so we have to be very clear about what the theory is. Each experiment can be viewed as a context that even if, a, uh, even if they're physically identical, they are not experimentally identical. Okay, the issue is how, how is to understand how the data impacts a substantive psychological theory linking the two experiments. So experiments are linked by theory. Experiments one are linked through counterfactual reasoning. This is the only way I see you can really link them. For example, outcome in and outcome X and 1 and Y and 2 are linked as follows, <coughs> can be linked as follows. A subject in 1 who chooses X would have chosen Y if placed in 2 instead of 1. So I'm saying that these are subjects. They're in one experiment. They could be in the other experiment. We're looking at what they could have done or actually would have done if put in the other experiment and put that in part of our theory. That's what our theory is about. That's the only way you can glue together these subjects in different experiments. So it's counterfactual reasoning. I have another way of formulating getting rid of counterfactual reasoning. And I think it is really counterfactual reasoning that goes on in psychology. And counterfactual logic is part of philosophical logic. And this is a good use of counterfactual logic, unlike in philosophical logic where they look at propositions like, probabilistic propositions like, if Julian Caesar didn't cross the Rubicon, then I say there's an 80% chance he still would become emperor of Rome. I mean, if you deal with propositions like that, of course, all you generate is controversy. You can't possibly 
not generally controversy. But epistemology based upon this sort of reasoning, I was shown that you can do quite a lot. So it's quite different when you apply it to scientific sort of things and you have data and you have a well worked out uh, uh, system. Uh, also, excuse me, uh, maybe you will explain it a bit later, but in, in what sense you want to glue these experiments? I mean, uh, the choices in one experiment completely different from choices in another experiment, distinct sets of subjects. Uh, so uh, what, 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 what is your goal? In what way you want to join? Because them you want together? to have a, uh, uh, a theory of, you take all the subjects together in psychology and you look at them as sort of like a common mind, a universal rule you're using. There may be individual differences, we can handle that. And what you really want to do is say that what is invariant across context changes. This is what you're after, some sort of invariance principle, right? Now, what happens in this particular case, at this particular level that I'm doing it, you can't talk about invariance because you don't have transformations. You can't talk about it mathematically, so you have to talk about it some other way. I talk about it by putting in linking theory that links the two experiments. And it's, so, it's kind of obvious. You do something today, I take down here. Well, what are you going to do next week? I'm linking your behavior today with your behavior next week. We do it all the time. <laughs> Even though your behavior next week is on different sorts of things. If it's on the stock market, it's actually not the same stock you're looking at because its price has changed, its features have changed, the market has changed. But, but it doesn't mean that your behavior has changed. It's linked to one person, the same person. Well, this is like the same person counterfactual. You know, uh, this is a human thing. If you want to bring the human thing in, where does consciousness or human come into this? It's this, that we can think counterfactually. <laughs> it's a natural way we think, and I'm talking about how psychologists reason. I'm not saying that, you know, psychological science is valid. I'm not going to go there. I'm just saying, look, I don't need to talk about that. That's why I'm not talking about it. I'm just talking about how I think they think about experiments. And I'm going to formalize it in a particular way and come out with one of them. Okay, that's simple. And this is no different than saying how you think that uh, people understand sentences. <clears throat> linking theory. The following example of a specific theory linking one to two, it will be chosen because it applies to quantum mechanics as well as to behavioral science. Each subject pair oh, I skipped something. Oh, yeah. So experiments <coughs> one and two are kind of linked through counterfactual reasoning explain what that meant. And for a given subject, an, out uh, an outcome x, and one or two is said to be actually chosen, if the subject actually chooses, chooses it, that's a good use of the word actually in this case. And, uh, it, um, uh, and it's in our data. Counterfactually chosen, x is not in the in uh, the subject's experiment, and X would have chosen it if put in the other experiment. Well, we don't have data on that, because X is only in one experiment, but that's okay, that's part of our theory, right? It's uh, how do we know that it will be? We don't know what he would have chosen. All we know is that he would have chosen. I can't say what it is, it's one of those items. That but how do we know that it would be chosen? Because whenever we put a subject in an experiment, we find that our subjects always choose something. On the previous, uh, from the previous experiment. It's part of our theory. It's a theoretical assumption. Yes. You don't know everything in your theory. So perhaps uh, we can uh, hold questions uh, for the end, unless they're like, necessary to understand. Okay. And then pragmatic, paradigmatically chosen, if and only if it's actually chosen or paradigmatically chosen. You mean uh, actually chosen or counterfactually chosen. Okay? <clears throat> now, 
what you have is going between experiments, maybe in quantum mechanics, some sort of thing that grows probabilistically that you can't see in the probability. It's a probability function that goes across experiments until you conduct an experiment. <coughs> in this case, this is what uh, uh, paradigmatically corresponds to, it corresponds to that idea. There's a larger unknown probability function spanning everything. And what we do is characterize that probability function. Characterize it what? <coughs> By looking at data and um, uh, by my theoretical assumptions and nothing more. Okay, the following example of a specific set of theoretic linking one and two is chosen because it applies to uh, uh, quantum mechanics. And this is it. If you choose this outcome from each experiment, each subject paradigmically chose an outcome from each experiment. In each experiment, each ex outcome is chosen by some subject. I don't want things of, of measure zero in here, but we can put them in, but causes causes problem. Each subject who parad paradigmatically <coughs> chose C, so we have A, B, and C, would have also chose paradigmat paradigmatically D. This is a theoretical assumption that I can't see but it tells how two experiments, how two items are linked, basically saying it's really going to be functionally the same item because from my data, I can't distinguish them. Things I can't distinguish from my data in this very strong sense, I'm considered the same. <clears throat> and, uh, and this is it. If X is one of our items, then this double bracket X is a set of of subjects that paradigmatically chose X, and what happens is for items A and E and A and F, etc., um, that they are one is not a subset of another, which means that what I'm assuming if some subject in experiment one chose A, then he has to choose E or F. If he chose E, then there's another subject who chose A who would chose F. And this is to make this, this linking theory and everything I'm going to get correspond to a quantum experiment. Okay? And that's it. That's the theory. Not much there in the theory. But the theory will give rise to a, a, an algebra of events and a probability. So if O1 O1 is the subset of one's outcomes and O2 is a subset of experiments two outcomes, let O be the set of all outcomes and E and F be an O, then I have these two concepts. Uh, bracket C, regular bracket C is a set of subjects who actually chose some element of theory. Okay? And that's just the experiment theory. But E can span across experiments. It's really a projection onto the experiment that the subject is in. And double bracket of E is a set of subjects who paradigmatically chose some element E. E and F are said to be equivalent if and only if, if a, the subjects who paradigmatically chose the elements of E are exactly the same as the subjects who paradigmatically chose the uh, subjects of F. And for each G and O, I let sigma of G be the largest element in the equivalence class that contains G. The equivalence classes have a set of subjects associated with them, and they choose the same things. I'm going to say that they're equivalent, and I'm going to pick the largest one. H is said to be a proposition. And this is how I connect it to Bonham and, uh, and uh, Burkhoff. If and only if there exists a G that's a subset of uh, a big set of alternatives that, such that H is sigma of the actual people who chose G. Okay? And for each F and F, let F both face F be sent for the propositions that is equivalent to F. So I'm going to associate F with each of those equivalence classes. And I do it the same for outcomes. 
It follows from the linking theory that the set of people who paradigmatically chose C is the same as the paradigmatically chosen D, because that's part of the theory. This is the same as the set of subjects who paradigmatically chose one or the other. And so C comma D is a proposition. Not everything's going to be a proposition. Throughout the talk, K stands for, the propos for this proposition. C equals D equals K. And we let P stand for the set of propositions. What we're going to have, as you'll see later, is that we start off with six choices. That gives you two to the six. The power set is two to the six events. What we end up with propositions, we end up with 12 events. Can't be a Boolean algebra because we end up with 12 propositions. Boolean algebras are all powers of two. And we have significantly cut down the size of propositions. This is the use of this type of logic and thinking and quantum like thinking in computer science. It's a way of cutting down things to things that are possibly relevant. You have a giant <laughs> matrix that you can't possibly deal with the Boolean algebra. It's a one way of cutting it down. You let E and F be propositions, and I define what complements are. It's uh, the proposition that uh, uh, you get by taking the complement of it, taking the set of people who uh, actually generate it, and then take the, propos the largest proposition corresponding to it. And this is a way of defining union, a way of defining intersection. All of this, this comes from the data and my theoretical linking assumptions, nothing else. And I end up with that I have an ortho lattice. Now if I look at this, this is a proposition, it's an ortho lattice. For each set A, we let the uh, uh, absolute value A stand for the number of elements in A. For a proposition, we take now as its probability function, the set of people who paradigmatically chose E over all people the set of people who paradigmatically chose something. And this is called a proposition probability function. Okay? And now the proposition probability function, we prove, has the following, uh, um, well, we'll start off with the general definition. If I have an ortho lattice, then Q is said to be an ortho probability function, and this is the generalization of probability functions, if it's between 0 and 1 for each event, uh, has the sure event and, and null event being the right value, if B is a subset of the complement of A, then it's additive. And if C is strictly less than D, then Q of C is less than Q of D. This last one causes a little bit of problems if you have measure 0. But if you're a philosopher, you handle that by adding in the decimals and get rid of it. Of course, our data, we don't have infinitesimals, but we're finite, so we don't have to worry about it. Uh, P is an ortho probability function on, on, so here's the theorem. If I look at my data and all of this, I have an ortho probability function on this lattice. Of course, it's not quite the type of lattice in quantum mechanics. Okay? Interestingly, if I take the projections onto each of my original uh, experiments, it gives exactly back what I would see in my experiments. That's because my propositions that the things that are actually chosen in the experiment, things that are actually chosen in the experiment, are also paradigmatically chosen and vice versa. So if I conditionalize on my experiment, I get the actual things back, which is nice. <clears throat> and uh, that's uh, all I really want to say. It's actually not, there's a sampling error, but it disappears in the lab. So what I have is now I prove that that is an orthomodular lattice. How do I get orthomodularity? I get it through the probability function. If you have a probability function on a lattice, it puts restrictions on the lattice. 
So if I know you have probability, once you say anything about the form, it puts restriction on the lattice. I derive what the form of the probability function was empirically and with my theoretical assumptions. And so I use that form as part of the proof of it. So what I'm doing here is really something very important that we'll talk about. I'm developing logic and probability theory at the same time. I'm saying the orthomodular thing is going to be my logic, it's going to be my, my uh, the properties I'm assuming about the event space. I actually derive it from what's going on. I use the probability function deriving it. Do I have to use the probability function? Yes. If I don't use the probability function, you can show that if I start out with the orthomodular lattice, I'm going to run into trouble because not every orthomodular lattice has a probability function. So what's going on is having a probability function with certain characteristics is part of the characterization of the logic. And there's an infant version. So this is a special case I'm looking at. The case generalizes to lots and lots of examples. And there's an infant version of all this theorem. If the version must use it the decimals because I'm using a probability function. And this is a lattice you get if you recognize it. It's a uh, well-known lattice and a uh, very well-known lattice in, uh, uh, in physics. But this it, uh, a well-known, better way of saying it is a well-known lattice in physics is isomorphic to this lattice. I won't go too much more in. Rationality. Uh, what I have here is my original, this lattice here, that characterizes my, ex my experimental paradigm with two experiments. Physics uses a lattice that's isomorphic to this lattice, right? So I'm actually, from a lattice point of view, I'm mirroring what's going on in physics. Now there's a very subtle point here that event spaces are lattices, and every lattice corresponds to, the, to an event space, but you get something more when you do probability theory by having an event space rather than having a lattice. It's a subtle point, but it is an important point. And having an event space, the way that we think about it in modern times, is we have a sample set. And we have a set of states and we assign probabilities, you know, the Kolmogorov way. That was invented by von Mises, that idea. Before that, people generally talked about propositions. Propositions don't have an event space. Propositions are true or false. There's ways in Boolean algebras of getting a nice event space that conceptually matches your idea of a proposition by taking all possible worlds for which that proposition is true, and I'll give you an event space, right? But a lot of things that involve Boolean algebras do not generalize to more general algebras or more general ideas of logics. There's something special that allows you to do things with Boolean algebra. So the Stone representation theorem, which justifies the uh, combination of the two with the probability function on, everything works out fine. It works out fine because if you have atoms that have measure zero, we would call them infinitesimals. These are events that are in the ordering just above the empty set and below, and nothing is between it and the empty set. If you have such atoms, they have very small probabilities and something big, basically zero. But if you throw infinitesimals in, you give meaning to it. The Boolean algebra is you can always add the infinitesimals, and you always can get rid of them by going back to measure zero. You go both ways. In more abstract situations, that's not the case. So there's something that goes on that ends up very subtly. In this particular case, um, it would. Uh, correspond with uh, confusing probabilities or interference or something like that could have very weird effects in abstract situations. I won't go into that. Uh, 
But anyway, physics uses. Uh, uh, I'm sure something wrong. Physics uses uh, um, uh, this lattice. That's isomorphic to it. The theorem is is that P, this lattice, satisfies generalized the generalized Dutch book problem, and that's the way I define the probabilities. So if I went to the power set of uh, of uh, of O that combine of, of all my choices across experiments. I can extend the probabilities of this lattice to the home space. However, it's interesting to note that this, the physical example, cannot be so extended. What is the difference between the two? After all, they're isomorphic. Well, the difference is intersection. In physics, and in the Hilbert space, you use intersection, real set theoretic intersection. Here, I have some odd type of intersection. So if I want to extend, so since I'm using real intersection, the atoms here has to be ontologically real atoms. But in my situation, it doesn't. That A actually contains elements of uh, uh, that A intersect E is non-empty, and A intersect F is non-empty. The states of the world are both of them, but intersect in this generalized intersection. Generalized intersection is not this intersection. In this intersection, they must be atoms, and the probability theory then tells you that you can't extend it. Okay, so something is going on by including the state space. Isomorphism is not enough. It's a very subtle point, and you have to go through these theorems that they have in lattice theory, the stone representation theorem, and the more general lattice representation theorem of Birkhoff, and look at it very carefully to see what's going on. <coughs> okay. And and uh, that's about it. So what we have is a situation where in physics you have lots of cases, and generally all the cases that of interest, that you will not be able to extend to a Boolean algebra. You have isomorphic situations in behavioral science, which you can. I find that very <coughs> interesting. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, uh, some quantum logics are with particular probability theories, not the quantum logic itself. Rationality is not being talked about. We're talking about probabilistic rationality. Some quantum logics are rational, and some quantum logics are not rational. Okay, the ones in physics are not rational by the standard definition of rationality. Of course, the people in quantum physics or the defenders or whatever they might be might claim otherwise by giving a different concept of rationality. But as far as taking the concept of rationality the economists would like, it's not rational. And I think you would have a very hard time applying uh, an economics quantum logic uh, to an actual type of decision that one could demonstrate violates the Dutch book argument <laughs> for the economists. Uh, uh, I'm having difficulty now with understanding uh, this uh, statement that they are isomorphic and at the same time the two intersections are different. The meaning of isomorphism would imply that if A, your strange intersection B equals C, then the corresponding A prime and their intersection B prime is C prime. That's right, right. It, in this lattice, but not in the Boolean algebra, because we have to extend the lattice, and not in the way you extend the lattice. It's so how the state space, the state spaces are not isomorphic. Oh, okay. So right. you lose isomorphism. The okay. state spaces are not isomorphic, but the events that we are looking at within those space, state spaces are isomorphic. Okay, thank you. 
that's what happens. There's no one-for-one -one function from one state space into the other that leads to a big isomorphism. There's only a lattice isomorphism to start with. And I think that causes a uh, epistemological uh, uh, problem from the people who say that, uh, yes, you can extend quantum thinking to Boolean algebra, but they really mean is you can't extend quantum thinking as the way that quantum physicists formulate quantum thinking to a Boolean algebra events. That's a little subtle difference, but for psychology, it's a big difference. We do not want to be forced, particularly if we're doing decision theory. And we're going to do decision theory for normative applications where we have ambiguity and other things. We do not want to have a restriction that we're going to be doing something irrational from the economic point of view. And that's my view until I become a psychologist. And I say, well, they have a crazy idea of rationality. <laughs> It really doesn't work. <laughs> but that's something else. I guess I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no questions, Boss? Um, so the beginning of your construction uh, reminds me of the post Specker approach to quantum logic when they produced the partial Boolean algebras by pasting together Boolean algebras. Have a whole family of Boolean algebras and paste them together, meaning you identify elements in one, the elements in the other. But then you do something that, that is quite different, which is to introduce a kind of closure operation using the equivalence relation, right? And, right. Yeah. Um, so um, at, at that point, I think you're sort of departing from the way they do quantum logic. Um, and so that maybe that throws a little bit of light on how it's possible to have this underlying disparity when the lattices are the same. Right, but this, this idea of identifying things across the world also happens in physics, right? Yes, absolutely. And, and that's what I'm using is, is yeah. basically the same idea that they use in physics, which is uh, 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 a little bit strange from an empirical point of view because it has to be absolutely identified, not approximately identified. So there is no idea of an error on that level of identity. It is part of the logic identity. And so what you have to do is you have to, when you do it scientifically, you have to sort of invert things. You don't look at your model as approximation of reality. You look at your model as reality and the empirical reality, again, is approximation of your model for drawing conclusions, which I think philosophers wouldn't like. Well, uh, but it's a where, where people suspect they could think it's a hidden variable. So you say, if I measure it, and then I measure, then I measure the same observer, but I, I rotate the apparatus a little bit, I should, it's the same thing. And they could say, no, 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 there's a hidden variable that actually distinguishes it, even though the statistics that will make any difference. Yes, well, uh, that doesn't happen yet. This, it becomes an absolute part of the theory. If it's not absolute, then you have trouble uh, interpreting the theory. So I think the best way is the old Pythagorean way. It's the mathematics gives you reality, and the empirical world gives you approximation or reality to error. And, um, uh, and that works a lot better trying to justify why mathematics works than the other one. Yes? But thinking of psychological modeling, the counterfactual approaches make a very strong assumption of identity uh, of the subjects between experimental contexts. In other words, they bring the same propensities of choice to bear. Well, that follows from the random sampling of this case. But I wonder it how means really statistically you're going to get the same, the same type of results. So that means that both samples really are samples of the same subjects, but they they are they are different. This is a, a standard way we do uh, uh, psychology. If you're saying that the standard way we do psychology has problems with it, uh, I agree with you fully. That's what you're thinking. Move between contexts in different orders. Oh well, yeah. Well, I haven't brought that in. So 
to really do things where you get rotations and everything, you need more complicated structures. And you have these orthomodular lattices, you have to look at their own morphism groups, and you give sorts of assumptions to, get, to start marrying what goes on in quantum mechanics with those automorphism groups. Um, the way I would deal with at this particular point about the order effects, I would put all the orders in as choices. If I have a, uh, 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 a subject make two choices in an order, well, I just take that those two choices as a single choice. And so I have four choices for the uh, order, and they take or don't take it. And so that, that handles everything well. It doesn't handle how a subject decides things dynamically. So it won't handle working out a cognitive model of the subject's choices, but it will work out having a behavioral model that describes his behavior. And, uh, but I really want to do uh, uh, cognitive models as well, and for that I really need ideas of transformations that need a much richer structure. And uh, the advantage of these four structures is you can do a whole, things, whole bunch of things you can't do in quantum mechanics because it assumes the whole linear group. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it, it'll let you, uh, quantum mechanics, the way to look at it is, well, we think of quantum mechanics as being very general, but it's enormously special <laughs> because of all the transformations it has yeah. and the things that you have to have in variance. It makes it totally uh, a weird sort of thing that you wouldn't think really shouldn't apply to anything else <laughs> because of the transformational theory. Where this, of course, you uh, craft the transformational theory for the particular situation you're looking at. So this fails to have very general uh, theories of laws. Outside of what you can deduce from an uh, orthomodular law, is, that is with an orthoprobability theory. And we have those laws, but those are not the ones we really are interested in as those general laws. They just say we have context effects. Uh, yes, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, in in the beginning of your talk, you uh, you drew a distinction between your approach and mine by saying that you are dealing with different subjects rather than replications in the responses of a given subject. I wanted to correct you in that, uh, you know, nothing in the approach that I represented is restricted to repeated no. things. No. You no. can treat different subjects as replicants. Okay, so However, what, I, what I meant to say was <laughs> that my approach is more restrictive than it is approach in this talk because I restrict myself to these between subjects and not what happened in a given subject line. And what I have to do is I have to change the ontology of what I'm interpreting to get what he does. So it's not just a simple trans, trans uh, first, the whole experimental design. Everything I do is based upon experimental designs. I have to give a different experimental design and a different thing if I end up with essentially the same mathematics. Uh, that, that's all I mean. But it was only a preamble. I mean, I, oh, okay. I, 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 I forgot wanted to ask you a question. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't offended by that. But what I, what I want to, uh, to ask you, or perhaps I want to mention and uh, to, to, to see how you react to this, is that uh, there is, however, a very significant distinction between anything myself or other people do under the rubric of contextuality and your approach. Uh, and this is that. Uh, in all approaches known to me, uh, including my own, uh, if you have context A and context B, the, the way in which you are the, uh, kind of considering the problem of gluing them together or finding the, the overall coupling or global section, people you know, use different terminology, uh, is uh, based on, uh, the, on, on some kind of element, structural elements being shared by the two contexts. Uh, your approach seems to be distinct in the sense that you have groups of people that are disjoint and group of questions that are disjoint. And so, uh, and I'm not criticizing this, I'm just saying it seems to be a very significant difference between contextuality problem and the problem that you are posing. Right. Uh, I think what I'm doing is a bit weaker. 
uh, and therefore I'm not going to get a strong results. Um, but um, the alternative uh, is to say that the set of subjects in the first experiment are the same as the set of subjects in the second experiment uh, before we start. They're the same set, so to speak. Uh, and uh, what happens is there's a mapping, but we don't know the mapping. And then similarly I can do that with, with items. Yes, I, I, think, I think it is, it is a, a legitimate and very interesting yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, problem. So, but there's sort of a difference in the way the, the aim goes. I'm not trying to, uh, I did say really for experiments, I really think this has more applications to things like linguistics and logic. I'm quite interested in, in uh, there's a, a, a something in logic known as uh, Robinson's consistency level, where if you have two models with an overlap, both models, since you have two models, they're consistent, the theory of Allen are consistent. And so the overlap, and say the overlap is consistent, it doesn't mean that the union of the two are going to be consistent. This, I think, is a, to get the union to be consistent, what they need is that the intersection has to be logically complete. <coughs> this is, I think, a real serious problem in science, where we have one type of results, physiological results with cognitive results, cognitive results with psychophysical results. The cognitive theory is the same for both. But if we put the union together, we get an inconsistent psychology. People don't recognize that this can happen. And what, what we, in this case, it even gets more complicated. And I'm quite interested in that problem. So that's one direction I'm going about how to combine theories in this case. And just, you can see there's something going on about combining theories here. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, the other one is linguistics. In, in linguistics, you have all sorts of context events in the, in the grammar and uh, how phenomena, phenom phenology is related to, uh, to grammar and uh, how uh, and in semantics and pragmatics. Pragmatics is, by definition, context effects. So, uh, uh, um, and I think this might be rather helpful in the study of natural languages. So. Oh. Sorry to say we don't have any more time for uh, questions, so perhaps we can uh, thank our speaker again.